Let's go back a few years. When I was a little tot, I was definitely afraid of Five Nights at Freddy's. My only exposure to the series was Markiplier's thumbnails and word of mouth. This one kid in my school, this kid was a little shit mind you, told me all the usual theories for the time. FNAF was based off a real tragedy, Freddy is possessed by a little girl, Foxy is a good guy, and one thing I have never heard of again to this day, the idea that FNAF 2 took place in a mall, an idea that Steel Wool would shamelessly steal almost 7 years later. I swore to never touch the series. The idea of FNAF had such a profound effect on me that I couldn't go to a Chuck E. Cheese without being terrified of Charles. One day, when my dad was at the gym and I was waiting for him to be done, I went on my Nintendo 3DS to go and watch YouTube. And in my recommended was Matt Pat's FNAF 4 Dream Theory video. I gathered up the courage and clicked on the video. And my god, this game had me hooked. FNAF 4 is why I got into Five Nights at Freddy's. This video is about FNAF 4. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is a very interesting game to say the least. FNAF 1 is some of the most iconic gameplay loops in horror to date. Is it a good gameplay loop? That's up to your opinion. Me personally, I do not care for the original gameplay loop. It's too focused on RNG and doing the same thing over and over expecting a different outcome. But FNAF 4? I honestly love it. FNAF as a whole feels so separated from reality that it doesn't really scare me. But with FNAF 4 taking place in a house, it adds that little bit of realism that it's missing. This is despite the fact that the FNAF 4 bedroom is one of the worst designed things I've ever seen, but that element is still in play. If anything, FNAF 4 is a better gameplay loop than FNAF 1 and leads to a better gameplay experience. Hopefully by the end of this, you will also feel the same way. On night one, three animatronics are active. Nightmare Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy. Bonnie and Chica both work relatively the same way. Slowly, they will start to head towards your door. If you catch them before they start making their way to you, you can flash a light at them and cause them to restart the entire process. Before you even think about flashing your light though, listen. If you hear low, deep breathing, shut the door immediately. They are right behind your door waiting to strike. Wait until you hear them walk away and then shine your flashlight. If you don't see anything, you successfully defended against Bonnie and or Chica. If you fail, you'll be met with a jump scare. If you don't check up on the two doors for a little bit, you'll be jump scared by either Nightmare Bonnie or Nightmare Chica's cupcake, depending on which door you forgot to check. FNAF 4 is some of my favorite jump scares in a horror game. Instead of it being like the previous games where they just jump at you, in FNAF 4 you see them lunge at you. You see what the main character sees before they meet their untimely end, and I really appreciate that. Security Breach ruined somewhat fall of this design structure, and I am very glad they did. Jump scares in FNAF shouldn't be typical jump scares. FNAF is a trial and error game, not a survival horror. After a while, the jump scares get stale and boring. The horror factor is gone. If you make the jump scares more like animated death screens, it adds more to the game and it makes more sense than a simple jump scare. Imagine if other FNAF games had jump scares like Ruin. It would make the game 10 times better. That's not to say they're bad games as is, it just gets approved upon by changing up the formula a little bit. The last animatronic is Nightmare Freddy. Throughout the night, small Freddies start to appear behind you on your bed. Dub the Freddles, they are your way of telling how close Nightmare Freddy is to kill you. In order to get them off your bed, just shine your light at them. Nightmare Freddy has the easiest mechanic in the entire game. Bonnie and Chica require you to turn up your volume and listen for slight breathing. Freddy just make you do a 180. But once you learn the sound cues, night one isn't too bad. Just don't be like Markiplier. Before the next night, you must have fun with Plush Trap. Plush Trap is, well, a plush version of Spring Trap. He sits on a chair at one end of the hallway, and X at the other end. Within a time limit, you must get Plush Trap from his chair to the X by using your flashlight. When you turn the flashlight off, Plush Trap will make his way towards you, dashing from room to room. If you don't shine your flashlight fast enough, Plush Trap will jump scare you, but if you take too long, you'll fail the minigame. The challenge comes from finding a happy middle ground with your flashlight flashes. If you manage to get Plush Trap on the X, you'll get a head start on the next night. If I can be honest, I recommend not getting the head start. By getting it, you have less time to get in the rhythm of the night, and more often than not, you'll die and the head start will be useless. But hey, if you're better at the game than me, then go ahead, get the head start. On night 2, one new animatronic is added, that being Nightmare Foxy. When shining your light down the two hallways, you might see Nightmare Foxy peeking around the corner. He won't stay there for long though, but it is best to keep him there for as long as you possibly can. Once he enters your room, he'll run into the closet and he will not leave for the rest of the night, which means you now have to check the closet religiously. The first time you check the closet, Nightmare Foxy gives you a little jump scare. Immediately close the closet doors, otherwise when you leave, he'll jump scare you. 
While closing the doors, Foxy will slowly back off before turning into a small plushie. If he ends up in your room, it's best to keep him as a plush. Besides that, night two is the same as night one, just with harder AI. Keep doing what you're doing and you're all set. Night three and night four are both the same as previous nights, just harder. Nothing in note to really say. But night five? Oh boy, night five is a different story. On night five, none of the previous animatronics are in play. None. Except one. Nightmare Fredbear. Nightmare Fredbear is the final boss of FNAF 4 and acts like all four animatronics at the same time. Nightmare Fredbear will either run to the left or right hall. If you hear him run to one of the halls, shine your light and then immediately shut the door. Shining your light brings him to the door and shutting the door makes him leave. If you hear laughter, Fredbear is either on your bed or in your closet. Treat him the same way you treat Freddy and Foxy. However, if you hear both laughter and footsteps, Fredbear is not in the closet or on the bed. I love this boss. Genuinely, it's amazing. Fredbear's design fills me with dread that no other animatronic has been able to give me. His renders and his sheer size and girth are terrifying, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You will probably die a lot on this boss, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Treat it like Dark Souls. You may die over and over again, but every time you fail, you get a little bit better. You can do it. I believe in you. Like usual, there's a sixth night. It's five nights at Freddy's, why would there ever be just five nights? But this time around, there's a seventh night. No, not a custom night, a full-fledged seventh night. The main attraction of night seven is Nightmare. Just Nightmare. Nightmare is really, really fucking cool. He's a black, translucent Nightmare Fredbear and is exponentially harder than anything else up to this point. I love everything about this game if I haven't made it abundantly obvious yet. So, that was the gameplay of FNAF 4. Well, that isn't the whole game. There's a separate game mode. When you select a new game, instead of heading directly to night one, you're met with a message that reads, Five days until the party. Welcome to the pre-night minigames. The minigames follow the story of the crying child, and the five days leading up to his birthday party. The first minigame starts with a scene featuring a small Fredbear plush. What did he do this time? He locked you in your room again. Don't be scared. I am here with you. After you press enter, the crying child will be in his room, the corner of the room featuring a collection of Freddy Fazbear plushies, with the Foxy's plush's head missing. In order to complete the minigame, all you have to do is bang on the bedroom door. It's locked, and being unable to get out, the crying child lies on the floor, sobbing. Tomorrow is another day. Four days until the party. This minigame is the same as before, but this time you can leave your bedroom. You can explore the house to your heart's content, but if you walk over to the TV, someone in a Foxy mask will scare the crying child. And like before, he lies on the floor, sobbing. This character is his brother, and a pivotal member of the story. Tomorrow is another day. Three days until the party. He left without you. He knows that you hate it here. You are right beside the exit. If you run, you can make it. Hurry, run towards the exit. Your main goal in this minigame is to escape the restaurant you are currently in. What is this restaurant? None other than Fredbear's Family Diner. By heading right, you will encounter an employee in a Fredbear costume. It's too late. Hurry the other way and find someone who will help. You know what will happen if he catches you. If you head to the left, you'll see shadows of Fredbear and Spring Bonnie. If you head farther to the left, the person wearing the Fredbear suit will appear on the right, which again makes the crying child fall to the floor, sobbing. Tomorrow was another day. Two days until the party. He hates you. You have to get up. You can get out this time, but you have to hurry. This minigame is just like the previous, but this time you are able to leave the establishment. After exiting the building, you are able to interact with various kids on your way home. There's a kid with a toy that seems to resemble Plush Trap, a kid who hates her guts, and finally, a kid who seems to resemble Balloon Boy. When you finally get home, you are once again scared by your brother wearing the Foxy mask. Tomorrow was another day. One day until the party. During this minigame, you can't move. You can't do anything. You are locked in the parts and service of the restaurant. The crying child calls out, Please let me out. Please. Please let me out. Zero days until the party. I don't need to explain this minigame, it's the Bite of 83. If you are at all a fan of FNAF, you know what this is, and it's as sad and heart-wrenching as the first time you see it. Can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry. You're broken. We are still your friends. Do you believe that? I'm still here. I will put you back together. FNAF 4 is a story of grief. It's a story of a child abused by his nightmares, nightmare fueled by a location his life seems to revolve around, a child abused by his brother, a child whose life was ruined because his brother wanted to have some fun. FNAF 4 is the best story out of any FNAF game in my opinion, 
and it's what makes the entire canon of FNAF happen. Which is why it's all the more disappointing that the newest FNAF book retcons the entire plot and ruins what made this series special. I feel like I should get some background on what I'm talking about. So if you know anything about FNAF, you probably know about the books. First, there was the trilogy, Silver Eyes, Twisted Ones, and Fourth Closet. All of them are perfect in their campiness. After the trilogy was Fazbear Frights, a collection of three short stories packaged under one title. I may be wrong, but I'm fairly certain there were 13 different books in the Fazbear Frights series. I've never read any of them, and I'm not planning on doing it anytime soon. But after Fazbear Frights, for whatever reason, another new book series was made this series being Tales from the Pizzaplex. From what I've gathered, TFTP is the same as Fazbear's Fright, just packaged under a new title. Also, information introduced in the series seems to have an impact on the game's lore, as seen with the main overarching antagonist, the Mimic. Despite the book series' many flaws, I love the idea of the Mimic. In general, Mimicry is a very unique idea that I wish was explored more in media. But why am I bringing all of this up? The newest book in Tales from the Pizzaplex is B72, which is coming out sometime in early October. Despite this, some of the book was leaked to the public, including all three stories, B-7-2, Alone Together, and one very peculiar story, Didophobia. Didophobia recalls the entire idea of the Nightmare Animatronics. Instead of the Nightmare Animatronics being their namesake, night terrors of the crying child he experiences night after night, the Nightmare Animatronics are instead lifeless mannequins brought to life by, for lack of a better term, weed gas as weed gas. The main character, Rory, is a kid that was kidnapped 10 years ago at the time the story takes place. The experiment started in 1983, which means this story takes place in 1993, which makes it so now Sister Location takes place after FNAF 1, as Rory leaves the FNAF 4 house and enters the Sister Location, as seen in the Sister Location private room. This also explains to us what the Midnight Motorist cutscene was about. William Afta was kidnapping kids to run experiments on, and this by itself seems like a neat concept, but by introducing this at the timeline, it completely destroys everything the series was building up. Originally, this is how the timeline went. FNAF 4 takes place first, the Bite of 83 happens, William kills kids, tells Michael to check out the Sissel location, Sissel location takes place next, Michael goes to the Sissel location, the animatronics think he's William, Michael gets scooped and becomes Urple, now knowing the animatronics are haunted, his sister haunting Circus Baby, Michael goes from location to location, searching for his dad and trying to right his father's wrongs. Third and fourth games in the timeline are FNAF 2 and FNAF 1 respectively, both involve Mike picking up a job under an alias in order to tamper and try to free the souls of the children a fruitless attempt. FNAF 3 is the fifth game in the timeline, Michael finally catches up with his dad, he frees the souls of the kids and kills his dad by burning Fazbear's Fright to the ground, or so he thinks. The last game in the Click Team saga is Pizzeria Simulator. Michael Afton runs a fake Freddy Fazbear's in an attempt to get all the children and his father together so he can finally end it all, which he succeeds at doing in one of the best endings to a horror game I've seen. Five Nights at Freddy's is, and always has been, a Sins of the Father story. The plot worked, and it was a good plot at that. But with Didophobia in the picture, this is how the timeline now looks. FNAF 4 is still the start, Bite of 83 stuff happens, but now FNAF 2 happens, FNAF 1, and then Sissel Location. I generally have no clue how to write the timeline now, because why the fuck would Michael be using an alias? It makes no fucking sense. And no, don't play the whole, oh, the games are in-universe games, but by the Fazbear Corporation, no the fuck it isn't, stop coping. Why was this ever considered a good idea? This book ruins the plot of the games, and I think I know why. In Scott Cawthon's library of content that was created before FNAF, there is one little game called The Desolate Hope. The Desolate Hope was a sci-fi RPG and platformer that plays almost like FNAF World to a degree. It's obvious Scott likes this game, it was referenced twice in FNAF World Update 2. Scott is and always has been a science fiction writer. FNAF was just a fluke. It's clear to me that Scott is trying to retcon the story and make it more sci-fi than it was. And if that means ruining the timeline, so be it. Scott wants to change the story and make it what he wants it to be. It doesn't matter that the story was already finished, it doesn't matter that these games have been out for so long that any and all possibilities have already been thought of and solved by the community, none of this matters. Scott wants it, so Scott gets it. After you are done watching this video, I want you to play through FNAF 4. And tell me, do you see any mannequins of the Nightmare animatronics? Do you see any weed gas? Do you see any sci-fi bullshit at work? 
Or do you see a game about a small child's nightmares after getting severe head trauma, constantly tormented by the characters he once loved? And why was there hospital items as Easter eggs? Why was there an IV bag if not because the crying child was currently in a never-ending sleep at the hands of his delinquent brother? Or does Scott not know any of this? Is it not worth trying to figure out the plot of FNAF because Dittophobia proves that at any time, Scott can just decide he doesn't like something, and then we have to suffer the consequences? I like FNAF 4. FNAF 4 will always be my favorite horror game, but Dittophobia is trying to butcher what it truly is. A Story of Grief I go, wah wah wah, Freddy Fatbear scared me. He is so scared. <laughs>